Hey there, brave fundraisers. Welcome back to the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. My name's Rob Woods, and this is the show for anyone who works in fundraising and who wants ideas and maybe a dash of inspiration to help you raise more money and really enjoy your job. Firstly, congratulations on hanging in there and doing your best to raise funds and keep learning in spite of all the challenges and chaos that came your way in 2022. I know it's been far from easy for many charities, and I'm sure there were times you had to dig deep and solve problems on many fronts in order to keep raising the money needed to pay for your charity's work. In today's show, I'm sharing an interview I did recently with a brilliant fundraiser named Louise Morris of Summit Fundraising, who you may recognise from some of our most popular episodes on major donor fundraising last year. This time, we decided to highlight and summarise a handful of ideas from episodes in 2022 that have really resonated with us, especially in the context of the challenges that fundraisers are facing when money is so tight. So here's the first of two conversations I had recently with Louise. Hello, Louise. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks for having me, Rob. You're very welcome. So it's that time of year again. This time last year, you very kindly did a couple of interviews with me for the podcast, and it turned out to be really popular. It turns out people really found these little summaries you were giving and you and I were discussing quite helpful, either to remember an episode they'd enjoyed at the time or to hear about one that happened before they were listening or something and people went back and they got some good value from the fundraising bright spot podcast episodes we've done in the year and so i'm determined to do it again to tee it up for the listener this is some listens i mean it's not most essential listens it's not even favorite listens it's simply in this episode if we could between the two of us come up with three or four episodes that we think are really worthy of note and there's something about them that we found valuable or we enjoyed. Are you up for sharing a couple of yours in this episode? Definitely. And the Bright Spot podcast always comes up on my Spotify annual wrap up as one of the top podcasts I listen to. So I'm probably fairly well positioned to give an overview of a few of the ones that I think hopefully are particularly helpful for fundraisers now. Great. Thank you. And do you want to just share one of those? You know, it might be informed by this moment in time where, you know, events nationally and internationally are what they are. Is the one that resonates for you as especially important? Yeah, I loved um, episode 107, which was with you, Rob. Rob didn't tell me to choose this, by the way, which is the cost of living crisis now. Three ideas to help fundraisers now. There's been a lot, hasn't there? Let's face it. You know, fundraising is not an easy job. It can be incredibly rewarding and enjoyable. But I think particularly in the last few years with the pandemic and now with the cost of living crisis, It is tough. And I love that there's just some really practical tips here. One, I mean, we can all talk about looking after ourselves, well-being. But what I particularly like in this is the angle of actually we do need to prioritise it. You know, burnout in the sector does happen. It is real. I have been close to that. And actually, how can we find the time to do that? And one really simple tip is if we are going to do something for ourselves, whether that's exercise whether that's reading a book for 20 minutes whether that's pilates yoga bike ride walk is to do it in the morning which is very similar to the tips you give about kind of eating the frog and I've had massive success with this actually this year because post-covid very much getting out of routines that were in lockdown and trying to get into new routines so I now do pilates most morning and I get up half an hour earlier and I go for a walk before I start my work after the school drop and I used to think, well, I have to I have to get straight back to my desk. I'm really busy and I have to start my work at 8.45 after the school drop. But actually, there has been no difference with me starting work at 9 or 9.15. So just that 15 minute walk. So I just love the practicality of how can we look after ourselves? And the other tip I think will be particularly helpful for people in this episode 107 is that 80-20 rule. So actually the 80-20 rule being that 80% of your income and 80% really of your retention is going to come from 20% of your supporters and trying to break down things, whether it's thanking, whether it's different elements of a corporate partnership you want to do more in depth. And rather than say we need to do that with everybody, 
actually saying we can do that with a fewer number of people, that top 20% or that fewer number of partners. Yeah, I'm especially interested in all the different ways and crucially the implications of that 80-20 principle. I'm more and more interested in that now. And I had always heard about it years ago. People mentioned it to me, but I sort of treated it, oh, well, that's interesting that, you know, more of the profit comes from relatively few of the customers or more more of the the gifts come from a relatively few of the donors I sort of okay but I didn't do anything proactively with it whereas in his book the 80 20 principle by Richard Koch he says okay be curious about where that is happening with your donor pool and then crucially what are you going to do about it what extra proactive thing are you going to give to the relatively few donors on the rel- or the relatively few events that are disproportionately likely to affect income that can follow. And in fact, in episode 115, there's a couple of really good examples of Louisa Dodd from the Sustainable Restaurant Association really proactively understanding this 80-20 split and quite deliberately doing extra things to engage and add value to that relatively small number of companies that fit that exact match of a, a what you might call her dream partner. Um, and the other thing you mentioned, yes, I think there's nothing more important at this point in history for fundraisers than getting good at prioritizing, looking after ourselves. The one thing I found really interesting is years ago, if you told me, get up a bit earlier in order to do the thing that's good for you, be it exercise or a bit of meditation or pause and be grateful with a notebook for five or 10 minutes. If you'd said, I'd have said, yes, that's a good idea, but I'm But sleep is so important. I'm not going to get up earlier for that. And my message is not for the listener to stay up late and then get up early. So overall, you get a few hours sleep in order to do these things. But in my experience, actually getting up 10 or 15 minutes earlier, paradoxically, I did find paid me back. So I just soon got into the habit of having to go to bed a bit earlier. But if it meant I got some good exercise or some good calm breathing or meditating done, before work, the paradox to me was a bit less sleep. If I fitted in this kind of activity before I opened my computer and started the work, it did really make for a, a more effective, productive working day. Absolutely. And I think if listeners are like, there's no way I'm changing my alarm time in the morning, even for a New Year's resolution, I think there's still ways you can try and fit it in. And that might mean that you normally are starting work at nine and actually you start at 9.15. So I think the fact that this can be done with really small amounts of time can make a really big difference. And then you don't have it hanging over yourself all day that you wish you'd done this or you wish you'd done that. So that's why I think that eat the frog morning really works, whether it's early morning (laughs) and you're a five o'clock riser or whether it's later in the morning, but still first thing for you is half past eight, nine o'clock. I think the principle is still there. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Great. And Rob, one of your episodes that we've discussed before that you thought would be particularly helpful was number 92, wasn't it? Yeah, I so loved this one. Uh, She was so inspiring, Laura Matthews. I don't know if she's listening now, but Laura came on our Corporate Partnerships Mastery Programme last year. And I specifically remember talking to her before she joined the programme because she's very competent, able, smart person. And she said that many elements of corporate fundraising, though she was relatively new to it, she was fine with it. She did quite well. The one thing that made her most nervous was the idea of presenting and pitching. And she'd said she'd she'd never yet done a formal pitch. Anyway, fast forward eight months later and she'd finished Corporate Partnerships Mastery Programme. She contacted me to let me know that she had not only done her first ever pitch, but she'd absolutely smashed it. And long story short, her charity Hearing Dogs had won this partnership with a national pet supplies retailer. They'd not only pitched brilliantly, they'd won the partnership. And initially it was due to be worth, I think, up to £200,000. But in due course, the company went on to raise an extraordinary £629,000. So well over half a million. And Laura shares in episode 92 a bunch of things that she's got from the program that she quite deliberately did differently or better compared to what she would have done that she really felt made the difference. And we haven't got time to explain all of those techniques now, but I think the the central model that really 
helps people get better at pitching through the program I just mentioned is this idea of the beach ball. And what I suggest is that if you're not careful, what most charities do when they get a chance to present or pitch to a company is talk primarily from their point of view as how they see the partnership and why it's great. So for instance, if you imagine a colored beach ball and there's six segments on it and there's blue, red, yellow on one side and white, black, green on the other side near you, most people, as they describe the partnership, they describe the entire partnership in the colors of the beach ball that they can see on their side. And what the best corporate pictures do is they, they lean around and see what colors are you seeing of this beach ball? Or when you look at this partnership, why is it enticing or exciting to you? And A, you've got to understand that with greater insight, be much more hungry to try and understand their point of view, philanthropically, why they care, and potentially business benefit, why they might care. You've got to not only understand that, but then when you design the structure of your pitch, make sure you're including and speaking in terms that the company sees and wants about this partnership all the way through the pitch, which is not to say it's only about business benefit and you shouldn't mention your cause and the problems the money would solve. But it is to say, even when you do that, do it in terms that the company understands or their customers or their employees would understand. And secondly, be unashamed, be unashamed about being willing to talk about why this might be good for the company as well. And I love that. And I think the thing is, pitching is something that if you're in a kind of role, you think you should be able to do it and maybe not get nervous. But there's always going to be that level of anxiety. They are big moments often that can when you've got decision makers in the room. And what I love about the approach that you just said, Rob, is that I think fundraisers who take that approach and really think about the audience and take the time to put some of these techniques into practice, they actually enjoy it more. Because even if you don't get the pitch, the feedback you get will not be that you just spoke about your charity and all the great things you do and maybe a little bit of a partnership idea. The feedback will be incredibly positive because you are exactly as you said, Rob, you know, one of the main tenants of fundraising is thinking about where is our audience? Where are they coming from? Whether that's a major donor or corporate, you know, a regular giver. And how can I talk to them in terms that, is understanding their world and where they're coming from rather than in our charity speak and all about us. Yeah, highly recommend that episode. Yeah, absolutely. And just incidentally, a slightly different reason why Laura says in that interview why she was on the front foot on the way to the pitch. She said just that morning and the day before, she'd got three or four lovely messages from other people in the Corporate Partnerships Mastery Programme, which had finished two or three months before, But I just love the fact that even though at that time the Corporate Mastery Programme was being delivered virtually, still there was this just lovely connection and solidarity across that group that meant that Laura had the confidence to share, hey, guys, I've got this pitch coming up. (laughs) Wish me luck. And then, that you know, there was enough warmth and trust and solidarity that they they sent those lovely messages and told her she was going to smash it. So, A, she said that put a spring in her step because she you know they helped her remember that she's good at this stuff secondly the other reason she said she was just really pleased with how confident she was and looking forward to it she was because of what you said because she knew she had understood who they were and what they might be interested in why they might care and she'd gone and created all these good ideas and that she just wanted to share with them. So like, she's a, and a win-win, really. It's harder to be nervous if you know that when you go to do a talk, you are serving rather than trying to take. On the course, we talk about the power of future pacing, which is where you see into the future what will happen if they were smart enough to choose you and you mock up some of the things that will happen. Uh, so they had these lovely little dog mascot toys because they are hearing dogs. And she went to the trouble of because these would be prizes for one of the competitions that would happen in the partnership. She wanted to show the panel what they looked like. And she took the trouble of putting a little branded ribbon branded like the corporate round their neck. And just a little touch like that. It's not the be all and end all, but it just shows a level of professionalism and going the extra mile 
that makes you look forward to sharing. This is one of the things we could give away if people do well in the competition. And another of them was they understood from their gathering insight that the company did really care about the cause and they, they thought that they the cause would be important. But also, if there was some commercial rationale to the whole idea of partnership, a key thing would be footfall. If through this partnership, people could not only enjoy supporting a good cause, but they also might be that bit more likely to come to the store or walk around the store, that would be no bad thing. So Laura and her colleagues designed this little mini treasure hunt for people who are wanting to support where you walk around the store and you collect little clues or fill in a questionnaire or something. And she went to the trouble of studying the signage in the stores and mocking up again what her treasure hunt competition signage would look like so that it was in keeping with that. And then not only that, she went and talked to a manager of one of the stores and explained why she was there and said, do you think this would work if we if we did this number of clues and signed it that way? And she, A, they said, yeah, the idea is really good. But B, maybe make it a bit simpler in, to make it more manageable. So again, no wonder Laura's feeling confident on the way to her <laughs> pitch. She's not only had a good idea, she's got a confidence that it's likely to work in the format that she's now got after incorporating the feedback. And I think some of the good corporate fundraisers listening to this, I bet you would have done some of those things. But I also know that for many of you, a, a big barrier to effective pitching is the mindset and beliefs of some of your colleagues who sometimes get sign off on these pitches. So even though some of these ideas I just said are maybe obvious in a way to some corporate fundraisers, the act of getting your colleague, maybe your chief exec, your director of fundraising to listen to episode 92, it may just help you win some of the arguments before the pitch to do it more of this donor focused, insight driven way, add value way, rather than return to sort of what I might term more of a curse of knowledge, where the charity needs to say these certain messages that people need to understand. I love it. Yeah. And there's such great tangible examples of how to do that, that hopefully fundraisers, if they're listening to that and interested in, in that corporate pitching, can apply to something they've got coming up as well. Hi, it's Rob. And I wanted to jump in really quickly to let you know about our two flagship courses designed to help you grow high value fundraising results. That's the Major Gifts Mastery Program and the Corporate Mastery Program. Rather than have me tell you about how they work, I thought it would be most interesting if you could hear from someone who's done one of these courses recently. So here is a short clip from Sam Harford, who is a philanthropy officer at the British Red Cross, talking about her experience. If you want to improve your major donor approaches and raise more money for your charity, I would really, really recommend Rob's Major Donor Mastery course. It was absolutely fantastic for me and built my confidence so much. And I really began to change my mindset and start focusing on cultivating for major donor relationships rather than major donor gifts. Since joining the programme, I've raised over £600,000 in pledges and donations. So I'm really grateful for all of the support and guidance from Rob. If you'd like to find out more, go to brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. Right now, Let's get back to another of Louise's ideas from the podcast in 2022. If we were to move on, Louise, I know that one of the ones that stood out for you is just a different kind of episode in a way, because it, it is about fundraising, but it's also about much more than fundraising and where fundraising fits into the mission as a whole. I think that was episode 108 and 109. That's right. Um, Shifting Power with Shukri Adan and Lulu Smith Smithwick of Refugee Action. I loved this episode and learned so much. You and I, Rob, we both work with so many different charities. We kind of have that privilege. And I've worked with a number of trustee boards on major donor fundraising, my specialism. But one of the really positive things I see in recent years is that real change to start including lived experience more at board level. So whether that's, you know, a young person's charity, making sure that more of their trustees may be a young, maybe that's making sure that they're in the programs, we're getting true input and feedback from the people, the programs are there to serve. However, what I had never heard of or never seen was getting that lived experience and input into a fundraising appeal. And 
for me that that was a bridge that my mind had not crossed and then I thought why not why hasn't it crossed that so that's exactly what refugee action have done is to actually get refugees with recent lived experience into the charity to look at the stories they're telling in their fundraising appeals to look at the wording how should it be represented and that for me was so powerful and something that I think the sector can really learn from the other reason I loved it is that sometimes we can think about doing something like this maybe others listening have had the idea I haven't maybe you have but actually then putting that into action can feel like a really big step because it's something different it's something very different there's also a relinquishing of control in inverted commas that what I normally write that copy or the agency does so therefore we can have that idea and not do anything about it and what I loved was the attitude of we're going to give it a go and it's not going to be a perfect structure to get that input to start with but we're just going to start off having some conversations and build from there and you and I know Rob with all the kind of fundraisers we work with that that kind of principle of actually giving it a go testing, tweaking, then improving, giving and and going on and cumulatively improving things rather than waiting until everything is lined up, maybe thinking, oh, well, this is going to mean we need a new advisory structure. And do we have to go to the board of trustees to sign that off? And it won't happen because it feels so big in our minds. Or if it does happen, it will be six months to a year later. So what I loved was also the way that Refugee Action went about this and hearing Lulu and Shukri speak about it is incredible so I really recommend those two episodes yeah I feel the same Louise I first heard them speak at the Tottenham Institute of Fundraising Convention last summer one of the great things is working this way is is so clearly right for your overall direction of travel and achieving your mission but also just in the short term The Christmas appeal that was designed this way, working with people with lived experience of asylum seeking and so on, this one raised 20% more than the previous year. And there's some very specific ways you can see that panning out because I think in their first or second session of, of looking at it, someone said, well, this just isn't a very good story. We really need this kind of story. And in fact, I know someone who's got this kind of a much more uplifting story. I could, shall I put them in touch with you? So some of the things you can totally see, well, that makes sense. Of course, the experts are going to have greater insights. But some of them were just more, what happens when you lose groupthink? Because they would say, why do you always do orange envelopes at Christmas time? I mean, it's not your brand, is it? And it's certainly not very Christmassy. And maybe the listener is aware that sometimes... We just do things the way we've always done them. And it's weirdly hard to to spot those things that just are always there because you're so close to it. So by getting a much more diverse group of people, including some who had little or no experience of fundraising, they just asked sensible questions, obvious questions, and came up with, you know, caused everyone to see everything about this appeal letter and envelope with much more common sense, clarity and creativity that when they showed the original version of the appeal and the new version, it just leapt out the window. It was much more Christmassy than the new one. It had, had snowflakes on it, had more smiles and happy faces on it and so on. So I really liked that element that I could totally see why doing it this way, the more intelligent and respectful way to achieve your mission did lead to increased income. The other thing I remember from that one was, yes, Lulu was really clear. We just needed to get started and it was okay not to have everything solved immediately. But also, and I think this makes it a a valuable listen for anyone who's interested in trying to emulate this type of movement. They were really determined to make this not only good for fundraising, but genuinely good, a good experience for those former asylum seekers to be involved in so that we weren't just taking from them, that they would gain something as well. And again, rather than assume what they would want, they asked them and they were open to hearing the range of reasons why someone might want to do this and what they wanted to get out of it. And they heard that a common pattern there was finding out about fundraising, learning, potentially improving skills that you could use in various jobs. 
So right from the start, they built that in so that there would be some training and or sharing of information about copywriting or about how you manage data or something. And then in the second half, the would, they would move on to the ongoing work with the Christmas appeal. And again, a charity listening, their experts by experience might want something different. But I think a major reason why this one worked is Lulu and her colleagues had a clear determination from the start for this to be win-win, not just fundraising will be better if we're more enlightened at listening to them. Yeah. And those themes of generosity, of not thinking, what do we need as fundraising, ultimately means you have better, more positive conversations. And that's sometimes hard on, you know, there's a target, you know, that's hanging around that you kind of need to get to. But actually, I think I really felt that generosity of the whole process. And I think that's partly why it was a success. And also that willingness to learn, you know, everyone listening to this podcast is taking time out because they want to be a better fundraiser. And that growth mindset of, yes, I'm a professional and we know fundraising is a profession and I've got experience, but I don't necessarily have to agree with everything, but we're going to open it out. We're going to just have some conversations. Some might be a bit uncomfortable. Maybe we'll get asked things we hadn't thought about, but just that openness to do that. You know, you and I, Rob, have worked with fundraisers that when they do that, there is this step change and there can really be that difference. So that openness and that generosity really came through for me in the episodes. So Rob, I know that you had an episode on matching from Alana Jackman that you wanted to highlight as well. Yeah, this is a relatively recent one, but it's such a strong example of a tactic, which I think many charities can do in these difficult times when money is tighter for many of the people who would be giving us five or 10 pounds a month. And we need an extra reason potentially to to seek a conversation with a major donor. And we're risking decline in our fundraising income. So what can we creatively do to very definitely make our confidence to reach out stronger and the proposition we offer to a donor much more enticing and persuasive that would help them say yes? And I think proactively creating a match fund from a few of your major donors and then offering that to your individual givers, your lower level donors, that if you give or if you set up a regular gift, the value of that gift to us, the charity, will be doubled because of this catalyst fund that's been donated already. It just is a great idea that I think many charities broadly know about, but could absolutely implement in the next few months. And Louise, it's one thing to have a a good idea, but I found the best way that I'm more likely to follow through on a good idea is if I hear of a real example where someone has gone and done it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, episode 113 with the brilliant Ilana Jackman, she shares a great example of a university she's worked with that did exactly this. Their key objective was to get more regular giving set up, i.e. month on month rather than one-off gifts. and As a university, they have often in the past had student callers telephone existing supporters, asking them if they would give and or if they would give regularly. But whereas usually this match fund technique tends to happen in some organisations as like a 24 hour or 36 hour giving day concept, what they tried was outside of that giving day concept, what if we call our donors and say, if you set up a regular gift now, the value will be doubled to us because of this generous catalyst fund set up. And the results speak for themselves. Overall, the whole campaign led to an 11% increase. And interestingly, they also found a powerful effect of calling people for upgrade calls who are, so, so A, more people started giving regularly. But B, they found that if you call people who were giving regularly and ask them to give more generously, for instance, to now give 20 pounds a month instead of 10, when you include this matching concept in those calls, it had a dramatic effect. Whereas normally those calls would be 31% successful, the success rate jumped to 47% success rate when the callers were asking people if they would consider setting up a an increased regular gift. That's an incredible difference, isn't it? And as you said, Rob, before about sometimes 
as fundraisers, we might want to do something like this. And there may be some voices internally who are a bit more cautious, actually being able to share this example or to share the episode and say, this is the increase in success that, you know, they had. Let's give it a go. Let's try it. And let's see what happens, I think, can be really powerful to have those statistics that Ilana, you know, succeeded with as well as the story. Yeah. And as Ilana says, the great thing here is it's not win lose. In fact, it's win win win. She gives examples of these two or three major gifts which get donated where the major donors were really happy because it was going to be used as a match to to unlock further funding. They love that idea of helping other people want to give. So A, they're happy and indeed you're more likely to get those major gifts at all if you're making this kind of request. B, as we've stated already, it's win in terms of more regular income. So individual giving income goes up. And thirdly, she also talks about how the student callers who were making these phone calls, they found it so much easier to make phone calls when they had this extra enticing, juicy carrot to offer people that they were telephoning. So they enjoyed their calls more as well. And in fact, she even painted a lovely picture of the major donors being invited in a couple of times to meet the student callers and thank them for their hard work. And some of these major donors are quite experienced business people, so just offer a couple of tips. But just generally, the celebration and solidarity uh, between the major donors and these students, many of whom either they are currently affected by hard times and they've certainly all got friends who are other students who are needing to access these hardship grants. So I just love the sense, again, of the, the joining up of the family that makes good philanthropy happen because of setting up this match. Yeah, it's such a great example of that, isn't it? And anybody who's worked in major donor fundraising knows it does not happen in isolation. And it's just a really good example of those silos that can sometimes kind of crop up between different areas of fundraising completely being demolished. And I love her involvement of her major donors as well. And the thing is, when you have something like this in a major donor program, when you're having more conversations and getting to know potential donors, you kind of can have it in mind in terms of who are the major donors who are more likely to want to be involved in something like this. Sometimes, but not always, it's those major donors who maybe have um, quite entrepreneurial flair, really keen to see their money go further, do more. And so it's just incredibly beneficial when you've done this once and you think you might do it again to kind of have that in mind when you're having conversations with donors, if they're talking along those lines and to be able to kind of bring those two things together is really rewarding, which I know Alana felt. So, yeah, great episode. Yeah. And I think that's at the heart of why it works is, is that entrepreneurial joy of making something even bigger and even better happen. Louise, time is ticking on. I had intended to get through a couple more episodes, but time's run out. Um, let's finish this one. And if it's OK with you, if we could catch up in a couple of days time and do a second one of these, because I know there was a couple more episodes you were really keen to share. So. Thank you for today. I hope our listeners find these four ideas helpful uh, and I will catch up with you for that next episode in a few days time. Thanks, Louise. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Rob. So there you have it. I hope you found these discussions helpful and that maybe it gave you an idea for another episode that will be useful for you or for your team to listen to. Remember, you can get a full transcript of today's episode with links to everything we talked about on the podcast section of our website which is brightspotfundraising.co.uk. If you've not already subscribed, please remember to do that today so you can get instant access to all of these episodes, as well as lots of exciting new ones we've got planned for the coming months. If you'd like to find out more about our flagship courses, the Corporate Mastery Programme or the Major Gifts Mastery Programme, and by the way, Louise is one of the very experienced fundraisers who provide individual coaching to participants on the programme, The next ones start late January 2023. At the time of recording this, there are just a handful of places left for each, and please be aware that they always sell out. So if you'd like to find out more today, check out the information on our website, brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. And just before I sign off today, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of our fabulous, generous guests on the show in 2022. I also so appreciate your help in spreading the word and the kind messages you've been sending to let me know that you're finding the show helpful. 
Louise and I would love to hear what you think about this episode, or maybe that there's a different episode that resonated with you in 2022. We're both on LinkedIn, and on Twitter, Louise is at Summit Fundraise, and I am at Woods underscore Rob. Lastly, thank you for listening today and over the past year, and I look forward to sharing lots more Bright Spot episodes with you over the coming year. <laughs>